Good morning. Good morning. Man, I'm excited to be in the house this morning. Right when I said good morning, I just felt a jolt inside of me. And my heart is pounding. If you could feel my heart right now, it's pounding a million miles per hour. Uh, if you've never met before, my name is Matthew, and I'm honored to be one of the pastors here at Venture Church. I know it seems like I'm confident up here, but just like you, I have hard weeks. And sometimes I think thoughts that have been spoken over me from a young man all the way up to the present time. And maybe like me, you can relate. I'm not good enough. I'll never succeed. I'm worthless. Nobody cares about me. I'm a failure. I'll never be happy. I'm so stupid. I didn't even go to theology school. I don't deserve good things. I'm a burden to others. I'll never get over this. I'm unlovable. I can't do anything right. I'll never be able to change. I'm too weak. I'll never be as good as that pastor ever was. I'm not worthy of love. I'm destined to fail. I'm a disappointment. I'm not capable of handling this. Did you know that studies suggest that individuals may experience anywhere from 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts per day? with a significant portion being very negative or critical thoughts in nature. The World Organization Health estimates approximately one of every four people worldwide will be affected by mental or neurological disorder at some point in their lives. In the United States alone, 19.1% of adults, that's every one to five, will experience some sort of mental illness in a given year. Our youth, from the ages of six to 17, one out of every six in the U.S. today will experience mental health disorder in some sort of way. And we know it as a church Because whether you're watching online or you're here in these seats today, you might be experiencing it right now or you know somebody that is. So you're connected to somebody. So today we're starting a brand new series titled Mind Your Mind. And today the title of this message is Who Told You That? Let's pray. God, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to realign ourselves with who you say we are. And God, right now, we bind all these thoughts that are not of you, that are evil thoughts, and we make it obedient to Christ Jesus right now. And those thoughts have to go to the cross where it's already finished. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, as we were reminded today of your ultimate sacrifice on that cross. Despite us, you died for us. You knew no sin, yet you loved us that much. And it wasn't just that. You were buried, and God, you raised your son from the dead. Thank you for making a way where there was no way. And I pray for those people today that feel like in their thoughts, there's no way that they're ever going to get out of it. I believe you make a way where there is no way. You parted the Red Sea. You made the blind see. I believe it, God. We've read about your miracles. We've seen about your miracles. A lady just touching your garment and getting healed. And then you going to a synagogue leader's house right after that and raising his dead daughter to life. God, we see it. People getting just just taken down from rooftops all the way down to you. A group of friends believing, and I believe there is a group of friends believing for their friend today for a healing from the inside out, from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet, whether it be mental, whether it be physical, whether it be relational. God, I'm believing for the healing today, and I'm believing, Lord, for your truth. In Jesus' name, all God's people said with a bold, amen. Come on. Come on. If you didn't know, I came to preach this morning. Yes. I knew Stephen would holler back at his boy. You know, growing up Filipino with Filipino grandparents came with a lot of amazing perks 
and really amazing healthy values, but it also came with some horrible cultural values. I want to start with some good ones. Filipinos have the gift of hospitality. Amen if you know one. Amen if you are one. You know, you probably got invited to a Filipino friend's house once before, and I think about the friend that invited his friend for the first time to a Filipino party, and he doesn't know what to expect, and he walks into the doors, and to his right are a bunch of aunties gathering around, and immediately the friend looks at his friend who's walking in the door, and he's looking like, what am I walking into? And the aunties are like, who's your friend? He's so handsome. And the friend's like, OMG, no, keep walking forward. And then your mom, let's say you had a, you know, an upstairs, she like literally just jumps down from the top floor and jumps in front of your face and now she's three feet in front of you and she says to you, who's your friend? Looks at your friend three feet away as if she's 50 yards away. Are you hungry? It's time to eat. Filipinos have the gift of hospitality. Filipinos also are very hardworking. We have a very work strong, a strong work ethic. My dad taught me this, and I'm so grateful he did. He told me, Matthew, everything you do, you don't do it 100%, you do it 125%. And I didn't understand it at the time, and I was so upset at him, always trying to get me to do more. Stop taking advantage of me, Dad. Right? But he would tell me, when you sweep, you sweep 110, 125%. But this is what my grandfather, my grandfather, Ingracio Gary Silvestri, who came here from the Philippines, and he instilled this into my father, who instilled it in me. And it's a cultural concept for Filipinos. And this is the saying in Tagalog, it's masipag. And what this emphasizes is hard work and patience as pathways to success. And what my grandfather and Gracio didn't understand was that he was building a biblical foundation in us without even knowing it because in Proverbs 10, 4, it says lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. And I don't know about you, but my grandparents, they worked in the field to save enough money to buy their first house on Polk Street. And this was at the time when houses were like $42,000. But they worked so hard. My grandma would sell things in the encampment and sell chips and sodas and hide the money under her pillow so that they can get enough money to get their first house. These values I'm so appreciative of. I'm happy that my grandparents and my father and my parents have instilled this into my life. But then there's one that's a very unhealthy cultural value practice that I don't believe is just in the Filipino culture, but I believe it's also among a lot of people in the room, and it's this, eat all the food on your plate, machu. (laughs) Don't waste it. My grandmother, when she would cook rice, you wash your rice three times. And, and after you're done, you, rent, you, you, you just let the water out and you do it again and you do that three times. She would take a bucket and she would release the water in the bucket. And she would do that and she would take her bucket and she'd go outside and she'd water her plants with that water. She didn't waste a thing. And see, that is something that my grandmother would try to instill in me, but she didn't realize that it would harm me in my future. It's a value of appreciation and frugality that promotes overeating and unhealthy eating habits when we're told, eat everything on your plate. And I'm still dealing with this today in my life. And maybe you are too. But what about you? You know, maybe you can relate to me in some of the ways that you were brought up in the culture that you were brought up in. What are some of the negative voices that you hear on repeat in your head over and over and over again Maybe you were told you're never going to be good enough, so everything you do and you touch, you feel like you're never going to be good enough. Maybe, maybe you were told you're always going to be like your uncle, or you're always going to be like your aunt, or you're always going to be like your mother, and you're never going to succeed in life, and you're going to end up just like them, and so constantly you're thinking, that's how I'm going to end up. What, 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 what is it that constantly is going through your mind that is not from God? And what you say to yourself matters. It matters more than you can imagine. Scripture says this in Proverbs 4.23, be careful how you think. Your life is shaped 
by your thoughts. Be careful what you think. This is in the Good News Translation. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Pastor and author Paul Tripp says this, no one is more influential in your life than you are because no one talks to you more than you do. Did you hear that? Isn't that the truth? And some, if we're being honest, have talked to ourselves in a life that we don't even like. And we don't realize it anymore. We've even partnered with it. We, we, we've even like, you know, been proud about it, right? Yet it's eating away at your soul every single day. I, I met a man this week that I hired to do some work on a car that I have. And he came over to my house. And I just started to talk to him. And we started talking about generosity of all things. And I started to talk to him about some of my, you know, biblical principles and values that I live from when it comes to irrational generosity. And he started telling me about some of the things that he believed uh, generosity was, what, was what, what he practiced in his life. And we had some great conversation and he was intrigued by, by what I was telling him. And I got to know him a little bit more. And I, you know, I asked him like, so what do you do like on your own time? And, and, and he told me, keep in mind, this guy's 23 years old and he's a very successful business young man. And he told me, you know, um, I don't do anything. I just work. Like seven days a week, all I do is I work. And I said, well, hey, I want to invite you to church, man. Like, I want you to, like, there's a community at 320 Church Street that I'm telling you right now, like, you can be a part of. Because I don't believe that God created you just to work and that's it. Who told you that? Right? Who told you that this is all there was to life? He said, when I was younger, I used to talk to people. Now I only talk to people when I work to people. And I'm like, no, that's not what God wants for your life. And so I invited him and I said, man, I love to see you. But do you see how we just start partnering with things? At a young age, there was something. I asked him what triggered that. He wouldn't, he wouldn't say he, there was something, though, that triggered that in his life to believe, you know, life is just better alone. And that's the place where the enemy wants you to be. He wants you to be secluded. He wants you to hide out. He doesn't want you to come to your V group. He doesn't want you to be a part of community. He doesn't want you to go out with your friends when they invite you out to go have dinner. You know what I mean? Why is it so hard to come to church? I feel like it's like the gym. If I just get through the doors, I'm good. I don't know what those doors look like anymore, but I'm trying to get there. <laughs> Freddie, hold me accountable, bro. No, he does. And I hold Freddie accountable. And Freddie, you're, you're like one of my best friends, bro. I just want to say that I love you so much. Thank you for always checking in on me and making sure I'm okay. We need community, amen? amen? We need community. Community matters to God. And I pray and I hope that that young man will experience the life that God created him for because he's not experiencing life to the fullest. I told this young man, man, Jesus came to give you life and life abundantly, but you gotta watch out. The enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy. Could the way we think, could the way you be thinking, causing you to, be or act out in a way that is not how God wants you to be. Maybe you're negative all the time. Maybe you're critical toward yourself or toward others. Maybe something happens in life and then you just go off, right? Like, beep! And I told you, beep! Well, the second one was deeper because it got even worse, right? And it just doesn't translate there in person. You go on social media and you let everybody know, this son of a gun, I'm telling you right now, he got me, I'm telling you, you know? That was my grandpa right there. Maybe you're, 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 you're angry all the time. Maybe you need a quick fix just for an instant gratification. Maybe you become judgmental. Blame yourself or blame others. You're jealous. Maybe, maybe you have this shame that's been casted on you or you are shaming others. And maybe you're here today and you're entitled. The Apostle Paul would say this in Romans 8, 5 through 6. He pins this down and he says, those who live according to the flesh... I just want you to know this. This doesn't mean your skin if you're new to church, okay? And if you're new to God's word. It's not your skin. Flesh does not mean your skin. This means your sinful desires, okay? So insert that there. Those who live according to their flesh, their sinful desires, have their mindset on what the flesh desires, their sinful nature desires. But those who live according with the spirit, someone say the spirit, the spirit of the living God, come on somebody, have their mindset on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Your thoughts have incredible power over the direction of your life. Experts say that 
These are some of the top ways and thoughts that cripple us. Number one, if you're taking notes, relational cynicism. It's a general distrust for people and their motives. People have taken advantage of you, so now everyone's always out for themselves, right? Everyone's selfish. You can't trust anybody anymore. Your guards are up. And when people that are good come into your life, you don't give them a chance anymore. And you've secluded yourself thinking that, you know what? I'm jaded. People have hurt me enough. I'm no longer going to trust anybody anymore. You know what experts say? It's generally because this is how you operate with people. Did you catch that? Experts say, because if you feel that way about others, it's generally how you operate with others. Do not kill the messenger, please. But if this is you, and you already feel it if it is, and something went off inside you like that, don't run, and don't keep hiding it from God, but invite him into that situation and say, Lord, I need you to heal me because this is not the way that you created me. This is not what you wanted for me. This is not how I love operating. He can heal you and he can change your life from the inside out, amen? Number two, negative filtering. Negative filtering, you're const- you're, you constantly are looking for what's wrong everywhere you go. You can't even see anything good anymore. You go into a store, right? And you get greeted, good afternoon, good to see you this morning. You know, oh, cool, yeah, okay. Hey, I'm looking for toothpaste. Yeah, I can tell your breast smells. Let's go this way. That's what they're thinking. That's not what they're saying, right? Right here, aisle four. There's a great selection. Hey, I got to use the restroom. Awesome. It's down aisle 30. But you know what? Let me just take you to aisle 30 and show you where it is. And then you walk up to the front, and then you see there's lines, right? And there's only two people in line, but that's just enough to set you off, right? This place is trash. I always come in here, and there's lines all the time. Man, if that's how you're living, I'm telling you right now, you ain't living. You're suffering. And that is not what God wants for your life. You go to a nice place to eat, you're always looking for what's wrong, right? Stop being cheap just because you want 10% off the bill. (laughs) You You meet new people, you see all the flaws in them, but yet there's like, you know, so many great things about the individual, but you see one or two flaws and that's it. Talk about torture, friends. Number three, if you're taking notes, absolute thinking. This way of thinking, it's black and white, and that's it, nothing else. A man hurts you, all men are bad. A woman cheats on you, all women cheat. Right? They vote left, they must be of the devil. You don't say it, but you post like they are. I'm I'm speaking to somebody right now. Just knock it off already and represent Jesus well, amen? We get it. Hold to your values. Hold to what you want. Come on. You do have freedom of speech. Do whatever you want. But I'm telling you, does it represent Jesus well? You got to filter it. Right? They vote vote right. They're crazy. They're crazy people. They're so crazy. Right? They couldn't answer a critical question. They must be incompetent. Right? They disagree with me. Time to write them off. Never again. I don't want them in my life anymore. They live in California. They must be of the devil. I had to say it twice. People outside of California think we're nuts. Right? Where's the Georgia people up in here, right? What'd they tell you? Don't, are you going to California, Noah and Emily? You know that Satan is all over there? (laughs) Come on, man. Some people are just straight up ignorant. Aren't they? And if that's you, stop being ignorant. Be more like Jesus. Come on, somebody. Are you tracking with me today? Are you tracking with me, church? Man, these are just some ways. These are just a few ways. But there's also some other things that you might be dealing with. I just have enough time for a few things. I only have 11 minutes left. And and, and in the Bible, there's, there's there's a guy that goes through just a moment in his life that all of us know. It's a man after God's own heart by the name of David. And it's in 1 Samuel 30. And we see David go through a very challenging moment here in 1 Samuel 30. David and his troops are, you know, out to battle. They come home and they discover that the enemy burned down all of their homes and they took their wives and their children. I don't know about you, 
but I'm strapping up and I'm going to find my wife and my children. Amen? But if, you know, it could get any worse, it did. Right? The, the, the men, they started blaming David for the situation that took place and they started plotting to kill David, to stone him to death. I mean, can you just imagine insult to injury? Now David, you know, him himself, his wives are gone. Now he sees all his troops are upset. Their, their wives and, and the children are gone. Everything's burned down. I can imagine there are just some thoughts that David is thinking inside and this is what we read in the word of God in 1 Samuel 30, 3 through 6. When, when David and his men reach Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David was greatly distressed. Have you ever been distressed before? Have you ever been? Maybe you're here today. You barely walked in. A miracle that you're here. And we're happy you're here. And we celebrate that you're here, that you're here today. Maybe all you could do is watch online. Praise God, you're with us online. Maybe you're distressed, you're overwhelmed. There's all just this tension over you and your thoughts are running a million miles per hour. Can you imagine David? David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord, his God. Did you hear that? David found strength in the Lord, his God. For some of us in here today, it's time to find strength in the Lord your God. You know, I used to walk in church and I used to believe, okay, this is going to be great. Now I'm going to get back on track with God and things are going to be so good. You know, you can already walk in prepared. You know, you can already walk in the authority every week that God gives you as a, as a son and a daughter of, of, of God. You know that you don't have to try to manipulate it. You know, the closer you are to God, the better it gets. You know, it, it might be hard, but you know what? He shields you. He protects you. He gives you a different lens. He gives you a different courage. Nothing can be against you because my God is for me, so nothing could be against me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I believe that he covers me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. I believe that I can stand in front of a demon and rebuke it in Jesus' name, and it's got to go. But we walk in here just, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Now you got, you got to believe it. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen? Amen. And you can have what you feel in here seven days a week. You don't have to just, you know, walk in feeling like this is all I'm going to get and this is all I'm going to have. No. We got to get into spiritual formation. Amen? Man. So 1 Samuel 36, 30, verse 6 says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. What did David say in this moment? We have no clue. We might have some insight, though, as what we hear throughout Scripture in the Psalms. And Psalm 103, 1 through 5 says, praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, he said this a few times, by the way, praise his holy name, praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns, uh, you with love and compassion. I'm sorry, let me read that again because I didn't read it correctly, okay? Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who, who satisfies your desires with good things because we have a good father. Amen? Amen. David was going to become an anointed king, chosen, set apart, delivered from a lion, from a bear, and from Goliath. And let me tell you something. It wasn't David versus Goliath. It was God versus Goliath. Amen? <laughs> Goliath never had a chance. He never had a chance. He was all ready beaten. The Lord protects David from Saul, right? From his jealousy and bitterness as Saul wants to spear David and kill David. Whenever David felt challenged, he had God's truth in him. 
and he would speak it out loud. He had God's truth in him, and he would speak it out loud. Psalm 103, 8, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abundant, uh, uh, abounding in love. Where did David get that? He didn't just make that up. No, that's what God said. That's what God said. And he described himself to Moses in Exodus 34, 6. And this is what it says. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord The compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. David knew it. And in the middle of everyone coming against him, coming back from battle, I'm I'm, I'm tired when I mow the lawn. I walk into that house, Anna better be, she better be clapping when I walk in. The edges look good. I didn't go too low, nor did I go too high. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. Come on. And then I'm like, I need to just rest for another four hours until I get back to my day. <laughs> David's coming in from battle with his men, and he sees that his family, their families, everything is burnt down, and everybody is gone. Then they turn to him. What are you going through right now? What are you going through right now in your life? And who are you going to, to make sure that you are going to fall into temptation, that you're not going to try to run your mouth and, 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 and make a mess of your life and cause more damage to the situation that's happening right now? Where are you going for your strength? We ought to learn something from David because he went to his God. Amen? Amen. He didn't just meditate on it, he memorized it. We must know the word to combat the enemy and his lies. And those lies, some of us have partnered with those lies. And it's time to unpartner with them. Some of us, we have to do some intentional things today. Like open up our Bible and start to read it, amen? Amen. I'm telling you, it's, it's worth it. It's worth your time. It's time well spent. I, I know social media has your attention. I, I, I know, I know because I know. And, and I'm telling you right now, try to do something intentional today that as much time as you spend on social media is as much time you're gonna spend in your word. And as it gets here, start to do this more. More word, less social media, Right? Maybe that's you today, and you've got to do some of those intentional things. I encourage you to do it. I've done it before, and it's worth it. Because what you're putting into your mind matters. And there are things that, are, that, that your brain is catching that you don't even realize. And you're starting to operate from those places. For some of you, when you go to bed, put your phone somewhere where you can't reach it. And let God give you the rest that you need. For some of you, you're stressed out because you don't get enough sleep. It's time to put your phone away somewhere else. Go to bed at 9 o'clock, right? And get up and feel refreshed. How spiritual is that? I love to sleep. Man, some of the guys in here are like, see, I need a nap once in a while, babe. Let me take a nap, (laughs) right? Because this world is not going to give you the truth that you need to operate in the mental capacity that you need in your life. But the truth of God, it can invade the places and spaces, I'm telling you right now, and it could take back some of the things that have been put in there, that have been spoken over you for a long time, that don't belong there, because who told you that? That's not the voice of God. But the only way that you're going to combat it is with his voice. You can't just take an audible voice from the air and say, no. But you can open up your word of God and you can start inserting that into your life. Amen? Amen. It's important. If you're not reading your word, what are you doing? If you call yourself a Christian and you're not in your word, what are you doing? It's time to wake up. Look at your neighbor and say, wake up. Come on. Some in here, and I, I'm, I'm, I, got, I got a little bit of time left. Some in here, if, you, if you're going to, to get past some of these things, you know, some of the things that we talk about here and, and with leadership is when there's like a, diagnosti- uh, a diagnosis and there's things that are happening in our life, we have to attack it from all angles. 
So we do attack it spiritually, but we have to attack it medically sometimes. And sometimes we have to go to the doctor and get a mental evaluation. Amen? But you go in there prayed up. You go in there saying, God, I'm trusting. Don't let any enemy try to get a hold of my thoughts right now. Lord, I'm believing. You use this doctor to speak into my life, God. You go in there with bold faith, with everything that you are, that God, you're setting this appointment up. And God, if it's not, then you better make sure that I don't go into those doors, that I don't go into that appointment. But God, I pray that you lead me to the right doctor that's going to lead me. And if I need medication, make sure that I am in the right position, in the right place, and my chemicals are balanced in my brain. Then God, if that's what it takes, because you set up doctors, and you set up medication, then God, I'm gonna trust you. Can we stop being ignorant, church? I'm just gonna pray the Holy Ghost. (laughs) I mean, that's great, and I have that much faith too. But what if they need to be medically evaluated? Are we gonna sit there and shame them for that? No, absolutely not. Amen? Amen? Just like the heart needs medication and the liver needs medication and all the things need medication and so does the brain sometimes. Are you with me, church? Some will need to turn off the news because just like Pastor Taj always says, it's bad news anyways. Some need to turn off social media, YouTube, and some need to find new friends. Come on. Proverbs 13, 20 says, walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of fools suffers much harm. Did you hear that? If you're, if you're running with fools and they're all like, come on, come on, come on, we're doing it. I don't know who those guys are. Uh, sh- come on, girl. I'm just saying what it is. Where are you walking into and where are you going? And what decisions are you about to make? And do you have a bold faith as you walk in there to say, in oh no? Do you? Because if you don't, then it's time to get a new set of friends until you can get to the place where you're leading them to the cross. Come on, somebody. Are you with me? Your thoughts have incredible power. And you have incredible power over your thoughts.